First of all, I'm really happy to see so many faces here. I was not expecting that many people on that presentation, so this is good. This is a good start. Uh, so it was introduced. My name is Michal Drovat, and I'm currently one of the tech ninjas and Ubisoft working on optimi optimizing a couple of projects for Xbox One and PS4. What I would like to share with you today is a bit of knowledge that we as a team gained during the last couple of months working on those consoles. And it's also a knowledge shared inside of the Ubisoft about squeezing a couple of additional bits, you know, from the, from the math that you get on GCN architecture. So let's get it started. So it's going to be actually a bit different talk maybe that I advertised previously because it's going to be more about hacking the new generation. So we're mostly interested in finding new ways to use the hardware that you guys might not know yet which might be a bit interesting from some certain perspective. So first about the GCN architecture, what is it? So GCN is a new architecture of GPUs introduced by AMD, and this is the architecture that we're gonna stay working for a long time right now, because this is the architecture we have in PS4 and in Xbox One. So the interesting thing about this architecture is this, it's much more closer to a normal standard CPU like x86 or SPUs that you guys might use before when working with PS3 or I know like just CPU style. And there are a lot of tricks that we can actually use on the GPU that we normally use on CPUs. So this is gonna be the focus of this presentation. Uh, so we have multiple consoles. We also have uh, lots of nice hardware on the PC side. So the GCN architecture family right now is spanning between uh, AMD R7 to R9 GPUs, also HD 7000 XXX, whatever you put in there. And we also have that on Xbox One and PS4. So eventually all the optimization we're gonna be talking today is something you can use in your cross-platform projects. So it's no longer tweaking for all the platforms separately. You can just do this code once. On PC it's a bit more tricky because, well, you require customers to have AMD cards, but it's, well, sometimes it's okay, right? Uh, about AMD this time around, those guys are very, very open about the architecture. So the access to the documentation is open. You can easily get the ISA set from AMD website. And on top of that, we have a bunch of really, really good talks that were shown last year on Seagraph and this year on uh, GDC. Those two talks that I'm very, very excited about uh, are talks by Leila Mach from AMD and Emil Parson uh, from Avalanche Studios. So those two presentations are presentations that you guys should definitely check out. There's a lot of basic stuff covered for GCN, and I don't want to overlap with what those guys actually shown. We're gonna see a couple of new things today. Uh, so there are like three basic levels of optimizing for this architecture. One of them is basically keeping it wide, so that means that you want to run as parallel as you can. Uh, this is something dependent on register pressure and many other things that were covered in those presentations. Another thing that you want to optimize is the LAU, so this is the focus of today. And the last bit that's super important is that GCN is very, very good at latency hiding, so memory operations. This is something that right now many developers are struggling with, trying to find the best ways to deal with this. So I hope that in, mo in a couple of months we might see some really, really good presentations from Sony guys, from Microsoft, showing how to really optimize that. Uh, so I'm just going to blast through a couple of slides very, very quickly. I just assume that you guys have some kind of knowledge of how GPU works. I'm just going to expose the, the ISA to you, so you're going to know what kind of instructions we actually have on those GPUs that you were not reusing on previous generation. Uh, so a very quick start, we're going to be focusing on compute units. So a compute unit is an atomic unit of the GPU that basically deals with all the math, it deals with uh, all the processing that you have on GCN architecture. There are four SIMD units. So SIMD units are the, well, like standard SPU, CPU SIMD units doing math operations. You also have the texture units, you also have cache and local data store cache for local data store operations. So this is like the, the very basic part of the architecture. What's really interesting to us today is how to use the scalar operation and use the vector operation that we have on the SIMD to use it in a bunch of new ways. Uh, so actually, I'm going to go back to the previous slide for a second. Uh, one very important thing for this presentation, for the sake of performance, um, in previous generation, we used to count clocks or we used to count the, the schedule units as on PS3 for NVIDIA graphic cards. This time around, we are talking about something called full rate, half rate, and quarter rate instructions. So to put it plain and simple, we can assume that right now, a single 
let's say, a full, full RAID operation on GCN takes four clocks. Um, why four clocks? It's dependent on the architecture itself. We're not going to delve into this. But let's assume that four clocks is our basic unit and it's called full RAID. If I'm going to mention something that's called half RAID, that, that's going to mean that it runs twice as slow as full RAID, also quarter RAID, well, four times slower. So we have a whole bunch of really interesting uh, basic ops that we have in an ISA set. And those are covering the 32-bit arithmetic and logical ops. All of them are actually at full rate, unless they are touching integer operations at 32 bits. Well, as you might uh, know, the 32-bit uh, integer operations might overflow or underflow. In that case, you actually need two ops to cover for an op that you're actually doing. So that means that, let's say, multiplying two integer 32-bit uh, numbers is going to require two ops at least. So in that case, you have a special int 36 for int 24 multiplies and maths, and this is something that you would like probably to use in your shaders. Uh, then we have 64-bit arithmetic and logical ops. So as you might expect, they run at half rate because, well, if the logical ops at 32 bits run at full rate, those are going to run at half rate. So it's like basically like doubling the op. And we have conversion and packing ops, which are actually very, very interesting. The hardware can automatically pack and unpack various uh, formats and can convert between them, running at full rate. This is something very, very useful and very interesting to know. And I'm going to actually show you a bunch of really cool conversions that you can use on your GPU. And the, probably the slowest part of the instruction set are the transcendental functions. So the trans transcendental functions are functions are, that can't be expressed polynomially. Normally, we, we are used from the history of GPUs that those functions were actually running on a special dedicated hardware unit. In a case of, let's say, Xbox 360, there was a separate unit. So let's say that you could run four normal ops, and at the same time, you could run only one transcendental uh, unit to execute one of those ops. So it was like four times slower. It was also stalling the, the pipeline. This time around, the transcendental functions are actually implemented on standard ops, but they still take quarter rate, which means they're like four times as slow. Uh, transcendental functions, what are they? So there's reciprocal square root, reciprocal square root. We also have sines and cosines. And there's a whole bunch of other macros that are supporting those transcendental operations. You can imagine, let's say, a division. A division is like a super slow thing on a GPU. And to have a proper IEEE normalized division, you actually need additional operations. They're going to do the safe casting. They're going to do the none checks and inf checks. So this is something that you probably want to avoid, and you want to use the RCP uh, macro for it. So as I said, there's a whole bunch of additional macros. Uh, those macros are mostly for, um, for trigonometric functions, and you probably don't want to use them. If you really, really need to use some kind of uh, trigonometric ops that are inverse, like let's say A cos or A sine, you're probably better off writing that yourself than using what's built into the driver. So this is something that AMD might optimize, but I doubt that every, anyone's going to check that. You know, just if you're curious, let's say calling one eight, uh, A cos or A sine is something like 80, 80 full rate operations, super slow. Uh, so this is something that you probably want to avoid. And then we have the last part that's quite important are the integer divisions. Uh, they're the most expensive operations you can actually do on the GPU, so avoid at all costs. I mean, you can, also, you can do unsigned integer divisions that are not that bad because in most cases it's just a couple of shifts. But if you want to do integer, integer divide, then you're kind of screwed. Just don't do it. So we blasted through the basic ops that you have on the GPU. Uh, the last bit I want to cover that is very performance related are the, the flow control operations. So you probably know that flow control can be very useful, as on, let's say, Xbox 360, where you had the branch processor and you could just skip through a couple of texture operations, a couple of LAU. It was not that awesome on PS3 because of the implementation of the branch processor. But this time around, we actually have really, really good flow control. Uh, what's really interesting is that we actually have three different ways of dealing with flow control in your shader. The most basic one, or like you know, the one that you guys probably know, is the branch. So if you're just going to write a standard if statement and just call it with a branch, the, you're going to use the, the hardware branch processor. Uh, what you should know about this? If you call a branch in your assembly, you're going to see a jump uh, instruction, a compare instruction, a couple of ways to synchronize the whole GPU. This is not that bad. It's going to take at least four full wait states. 
a single wait state can take like four clocks. So you're dealing at least with 16 clocks of latency just going for the branch. So if you have something that you want to skip, let's say, a big piece of code and you want to skip it fast, you're probably better off going for a branch. If you would like to skip, let's say, um, I know, a texture operation, you want to go for a branch because the latency of the texture operation is going to be higher than the, the branch itself. However, if you're dealing with, let's say, local data storage, uh, the, the memory operation of the local data storage is actually faster than the branch. So in that case, you don't want to use a branch. So there are a couple of like latency things that you can try to, let's say, abuse when deciding if you want to go for a branch or not. So what do you do if you don't go for a branch? Uh, there's something that right now is not really exposed in the drivers. Uh, AMD has a couple of secret drivers that are actually kind of using that, but not really. Uh, there's one compiler on one of the consoles that can actually expose this to you, and you really, really want to get interested into this way of skipping instructions. So what is vSkip? vSkip is a special register that you have on GCN that allows you to blast through a bunch of scheduled instructions at super, super high speed. By super high speed, I mean you can, let's say, blast through 10 operations at one clock. So if none of those uh, operations is actually a texture fetch or any kind of like VMEM op, which means that you're synchronizing buffers or doing something with memory operations, you can just skip through it, so, which is pretty, pretty awesome. So if you're thinking about implementing, let's say, a tile-based forward render, a tile-based lighting render, you probably have a lot of LAU code for different light types. So you could branch them out, but that's going to cost you the initial 16 cycles of latency of branch and the code that you're skipping. Or you go with vSkip, which would be much, much faster if you're just blasting through LAU ops. So this is something that you probably want to keep an eye on. And select. So select is a standard conditional mask that probably all of you guys know from standard CPUs. Uh, this was implemented a tiny bit different on previous generation of, of hardware. Right now, this actually ends up as a CND mask. So if you would do a single if statement or you're going to use a ternary operation for an if statement, most compilers out of the box are just going to give you a CND mask. So CND mask runs at full rate. It's basically taking a comparison state and then selecting one or the other value based on the comparison state. Super fast, you use it a lot. If you have doubts in your shader that maybe you're using too many if statements and you see that it's kind of slow, maybe the compiler is just pushing branches on you, check your assembly. In that case, just go for a CND mask and you should be fine. Also, another cool thing that I maybe didn't mention yet is that the CND mask is a single op that's not going to cost you any registers because it's using the registers that you're currently using. If you're going to go for a branch, for a branch you need one register for a single branch to mark your, your instruction counter for the jump operation. So if you're going to end up with, let's say, branch inside of a branch inside of a branch, you're going to have that many additional registers used just for the, for the labels for jump operations. In the case of conditional mask, you don't have that. So maybe if you're running low on registers, maybe you want to change your branches to, to a vSkip, or I mean the, the selector operation. So now we're getting to IEEE. So if, if a couple of you guys were working on the launch titles for Xbox or PS4, you probably kind of hit this. Uh, so both compilers and also the PC compiler switched recently to IEEE uh, non-safe operations, which means that you're not safe against dividing by zero, you're not safe against dividing uh, by infinities or nans or whatever, so you need to do your, all the nan checks yourself, which is good. I mean, you as programmers, you should deal with those things. Uh, as a side effect of this is that there's a free operation mode on GCN to issue an instruction as a ternary operation. So if your instruction doesn't need to account for IEEE safety mode, you can actually blast a bunch of additional ops that can take three or two inputs and blast out one or two outputs. In that case, we're talking about the input modifiers and the output modifiers that out of the box are probably not in your compiler unless you have the newest one for like, let's say, last month. So what's cool about those additional output modifiers? So you can basically right now code like a ninja and have something like this. So a saturate, absolute value, negative, and multiply by four, two, or eight in a single operation, which is really, really nice if you have a bunch of operations that are doing, like, say, space conversions, like imagine texture space to screen space. A lot of those numbers can be just blasted into one op. 
So this is pretty cool if you have a code that does some kind of SSAO, some multi-sampling, some kind of ray tracing, because you end up with a code like that inside of your loop. If you're doing 100 operations like this, you know, iterating all over your, your screen, then this is going to save a lot of ops. So just try to use that. If your compiler is not giving you this pretty, really nice op, just check it out yourself. Ask your guys from whatever, Microsoft ATG or Sony ATG. You should get that out of the compiler. So the output modifiers are basically MUL2, MUL4, MUL8, DIV2, D4. There seems to be a divide by 8, but that's kind of unconfirmed, so I, I'm not saying a thing. Uh, also, most of the compilers are going to just blast through this automatically if you have fast math enabled and your IEEE compliance disabled. So maybe you need to play a bit with your flags in the compiler. The Windows drivers, on the other hand, when they run in a graphics mode, they actually run with no IEEE strict, so they're actually on the fast path. If you're going to run in the compute pipeline on PC, it's going to run the slower path. So keep that in mind if you try to have, let's say, a binary comparison between the results of graphic ops and, let's say, a compute op. Uh, so when talking about VOP3 uh, restrictions, it's a tiny bit different than it used to be on NVIDIA cards, because those cards actually had it for a while, but a bit different implementation. The restrictions are mostly on literals and the sources of the VGPR1 and 2 that goes into the instruction, right? So just to give you a short example previously, when you have your, uh, uh, your MOL operation here, you have, well, obviously the V0 is the output, you have the input and the second input. So in case of your inputs, there are restrictions saying that you can't actually combine two inputs that are from scalar registers, or let's say that are constants. It's not that easy. So sometimes, depending on what you're doing, you might not end up with a VOP free op, like let's say a mat or FMA mask or something like that. So if, if vSource 1 and vSource 2 is actually going to be a non-register uh, register source, you might not end up with a VOP free, and then it's actually going to get slower. Easy case to see that because you know you are guys are programmers, so it's going to be easier to see it here. Uh, so this is one of the very simple pieces of code that we had in our engine. So this is a base thing of going between texture space and screen space. So what do you do? You just get your coordinates for like multiply by two plus one or minus one, and depending on your on your space, let's say it's OpenGL and DirectX. So you just take your input in UV. You want to mat it, multiply at, multiply at on y, and you expect this to happen in two ops, right? Unfortunately, because those restrictions are in place here, the in FOVX and in FOVZ, or the whole in FOV, is not a register uh, directly, it's a, it's a source from the scalar registers. It's in, in that case, it would be like a uniform or a constant that you just preload in your shader. So in that case, you can't use this, and you're going to end up with this. You're going to end up with a scalar load from your registers for, uh, to the registers from the buffer. You're going to end up with your in FOV here in your V2, V3. Then there's going to be some kind of scalar memory weight, which doesn't really matter that much, actually. And then you end up with Mac and Mac. So Mac, Mac are actually kind of like, uh, like math operations. It's like multiply, add with carry. But it doesn't really matter. The point is that instead of getting two mats, you're getting like five ops, and you don't want that. So what you can do, you can just patch those constants manually. So if the compiler actually knows that it can, uh, what kind of constants it can use, it can use a couple of, of built-in constants, or it can actually patch that in using a different subset of instructions. Now, this really gets interesting. This is something that guys from Infamous were using for Second Son. This is something that I've been using on Killzone, I've been using on Ubisoft, at Ubisoft right now. So you can actually patch a bunch of constants as you used to do on PS3, and you can actually make your shaders run much, much faster. So in that silly case like that, we, saved, we shaved off three ops, right? Or I mean, I'm not counting the wait state. So we shaved off three ops. If you have a code like that in your ray tracer, or like ray marcher, this is going to get like twice as fast if your ALAU is stuck. So it's, it's good to keep that in mind. Also, if you have particle systems, it's also going to help. So what are the built-in uh, literals? So you have built-in 1, 2, 4, 8, plus, minus. They're built-in, and you can use them with uh, mat AK and mat MK. So mat AK, mat MK are for like constant mul and constant add. So you can use them. I mean, the compiler is going to do it for you if you patch those literals manually. 
So this is something you should reconsider. Uh, obviously, there's always a trade-off between amount of different shaders you're going to end up in your game and, uh, well, basically how much you want to optimize in the compilation stage. What I can recommend is that if you have a couple of particle shaders that are reused all over the place, you probably want to patch them in. If you have a bunch of shaders that are made by artists, in that case, well, it gets a bit tricky, right? In one of the games I'm shipped, we had something like half a million different shaders per one level in the game. It was an FPP shooter. So you can imagine that we have half a million different shaders because they ended up different due to artists putting in different values into the shader. In that case, well, patching that was kind of hardcore. I'm not really sure if that was worth it. So in that case, you have to reconsider. But if you have, let's say, only like 200 different shaders, well, then in case, just patch it up. Uh, we have also very nice ternary operations on, on main, max, and medium. This is pretty awesome. So if you guys are doing some sort of filtering or sorting, you probably want to use min, max, or med. Med is basically the medium value or a clamp. Normally what a clamp does, it does, you know, like X um, minimal bounds, maximum bounds, and you take, well, min, max, or X, right? So this is exactly what the medium does for you. So it's pretty cool. It's really nice in, in sorting and reduction passes. OK, so now we're getting to something a bit more meaty. Uh, we've got the packing ops. So packing ops are something new on GCN. They are used for the compressed MRT output. So probably if you're playing a bit with GCN, you've seen that a bunch of, uh, of MRTs are compressed. They're actually stored as like half floats instead of full floats. That probably caused a lot of mass on some PS4 implementations. I can just imagine that. Uh, but the cool part is that you can use those ops to convert inside of your shader. So if you'd like to, let's say, pack two floats 32 into one register just by downcasting them to FP16, you can do with those ops. Those ops are actually called like V underscore CVT something something. So it can go from U norms to, to let's say, floats, S norm, ins, whatever. Uh, that is the cool part. The not the cool part is that, that you guys are actually missing the decompression operations. So the hardware can only compress, it can't decompress. So the decompress, decompression ops, they have to be written manually, which might be quite a hassle when you're trying to hook everything up. So in that case, uh, you have a bunch of other ops that are new to GCN. So what's interesting is that GCN is a fully integer-capable GPU, so you can do integer math as if you would do that on a normal CPU. And this is really, really amazing stuff that you can do because all the tricks from integer math, they apply right now on your GPU. So you have a bunch of special ops for masking, bit shifts, uh, combination of integers, expanding integers, downcasting, appcasting. And two very, very interesting ones are, are uh, bit field extract masks. So the BFE I32 and BFE U32 are bit field extract for unsigned integers and signed integers. What's really interesting about this is that one BFE op is basically a bit shift and a mask. So you can clearly see it here in the Bitfield Extract implementation that I'm giving you guys, just like a reference, that instead of manual Bitfield masking as you use with bit shifts, you just call this, and it's going to be done. I think that this is actually in HLSL under something like Bitfield mask, or you just need to check it yourself. Eventually, every compiler right now supports this. And the more interesting part is that what, you, what happens when you actually use it with integers. So as you probably know, integers on the GPU are well standard integers. There are two's complement. Just to give you a quick reminder what, just, what the two's complement integer is, is that, that the, the carrying sign of the integer is basically, well, multi duplicated in the front of the number just to give you a sign of the actual integer. Well, I mean, it's like super basic thing, so probably you guys know that. But it's a bit trickier if you actually want to do upcasting or downcasting of your integers, keeping them to complement or packing them. In that case, all this math here just happens in one BFE mask that I just shown you. So if you have a bunch of like numbers that you want to pack, and you would just pack them as, as integers, you would normally have to carry for the, for the carrying zero, right? And this op is going to do it for you. So Lot, I know that a lot of people didn't consider packing integers together before just because of this cost of this whole operation here. Now this is pretty much for free. So a very awesome side effect of this is that you can easily pack two integers, like casting them to in 16 and packing them into one uh, VGPR or one in 32, uh, basically for free. Uh, so this is the code that you should use for packing into int 2 to one int. 
this is actually compliant, bit compliant with what you would get from the software rasterizer from uh, WDM, the, the, the Windows driver. So this is actually compliant on both ends, on software end and on the GPU end. If you want to have uh, bit conversions between those formats, it's just going to work. And this implements the GCN AMD implementation of sign normalized numbers. It's actually a bit different from DirectX implementation, so probably just check your implementations. But eventually, you can pack two numbers to sign normalize super easy with this. This is going to compile down to what? One, two, four ops. Four ops for two numbers. I would say this is pretty much for free. So where you can use this, this all additional super awesome stuff? Uh, one of the cases that we had in our engine was that we had super slow SSAO, we had super slow filtering of the SSAO. It was basically doing a bilateral filter. A bilateral filter, just to remind you, is a filter that's, uh, that's sampling a pixel's depth, pixel's normals, and pixel's data. Then it basically gaffers the whole surrounding, so it samples a neighborhood of that pixel, and it calculates the weights from the depth differences and normal differences, and then outputs the data, which is well basically blurred or not blurred. So normally what you do, you just have a couple of buffers, let's say, I know, 16-bit buffer for normals, 16-bit buffer for depth, and let's say 8-bit buffer for your SSAO or whatever, and you have to sample all those buffers. Some guys are packing them together. I've seen a lot of implementations that are actually packing, let's say, like the, the RG16 format, where you have 16 bits in your R and, say, 16 bits in your G for, uh, for depth, and then you do bilateral, but then you lose your normals. So the implementation that we had in Engine was actually doing exactly what I said, and it was also sampling the normal texture. It was pretty expensive. I can't give you numbers, but let's just assume right now it's expensive. So what we did, we actually used the unsigned in 32 format to manually pack all the data, and we ended up with this kind of data packing format. So eight bits for the data, 16 bits for the depth, and we use four bits sign normalized numbers for normals. It might not seem a lot like four bits for, for normals, but actually it was enough for the filter. Keep in mind that when you filter something, you're doing, um, well, you are effectively doing multi-sampling, right? So you average out the, the error distribution from that function. Then you can use a gaffer. Gaffer is basically like a sample or load for a texture unit. It gets all the four values from the bilinear footprint that you would normally get for a bilinear sample. So if you want to get a neighborhood of, let's say, four by four pixels, you can do it with, uh, sorry, with, it's going to be, uh, yeah, four by four. It's going to be four gaffers. In that case, with one gaffer, you get four times data, four times depth, four times normal. So this made our filtering passes about 30 to 40% faster. So I can only highly recommend this because the packing and unpacking cost right now is pretty much irrelevant with the memory operations that you're going to pay for this. Uh, another cool, cool hack that you can use with integer math is count bits and first bit high and first bit low. So this is well known to a couple of you guys who are using SPUs to do some bit magic and integer magic. Uh, so let's say a fast log two on integers, what it is actually. It's basically the, the, first, the, the, the first occurrence of a bit set to your number. So instead of doing the expensive log two or whatever, you just do that and you have the logarithm on your integers. So this is quite cool, this is quite fast. But what you can also use this for is basically doing Boolean uh, optimization when you have a lot of Boolean passes in your shader, like having multiple if statements or if else statements. So how would that work? So I'm showing you a, a huge piece of code right now, so don't worry about this. I'm just going to give you a general idea of what it's doing. You don't really need to understand what's happening right now. Uh, so this code is a code from my software rasterizer that was basically doing the manual software clipping of a triangle that goes through the near plane. So the quick idea is that if a triangle is being cut, it can be cut in different ways, right? You, you can cut off it, at, let's say, at one vertex or at two vertices. So one vertex behind near plane or two vertices are behind near plane. If you then want to do a, a proper clipping of the triangle, you actually need to sort those vertices first depending of on which vertex ended up be behind the, the near plane. So this code is pretty much doing that for you, right? So you have an if statement with, one, with two booleans, two booleans, two booleans. So we have three sums of two ends on booleans. That's, that's a lot of compares here, right? And this code ends up in something super ridiculous. It ends up as like 42 LAU running at full rate with almost with actually four branches. So this is going to execute at something like, I know, 100 full cycle uh, LAU ops. 
which is not great. This is going to be actually pretty slow. What you can do, you can actually optimize all those Boolean masks that you have here with count set bits. Eventually, on PC, if you'll be doing this code on CPU, you would never do it like that. You would probably just have an 8-bit uh, mask, a bit field mask. You would set those bits from the Boolean statements manually. And then, depending on the bit in the bit field, you would actually select the order of your vertices. This is the way how it's done in really fast software as risers on CPU. So now, we can actually do it on the GPU. What you do, you use the bit field as well. You just use that real unsigned int, because you finally have access to it. You just pack your bits, depending on your comparison states. And then what you do, you just get a count set bits on your bit field. So this one line of code here actually equals all this. So if you can do a Boolean reduction pass based on bit field masks, this is going to really, really help you in your shader. So what that meant for us is this, that we went down from 42 LAU and four branches to 35 LAU at full rate and no branches whatsoever. So I had a software rasterizer that was running the previous code. My software rasterizer was running, let's say, at 100% efficiency, whatever. With this, it's actually running 25% faster. And the clipping code is actually three and a half times faster. So this is some kind of micro-optimization that you might feel it might be irrelevant to your code. But I, I'm pretty sure that many of those complex tile-based light renders with tons of Boolean statements, they're probably ending up with a bunch of branches where you don't really need them. You're probably going to be better off with bit field masking. So just use your CPU skills on the GPU, because now you can. OK, a bit about cube mouse. So this is something that I find super exciting myself. So maybe, maybe I'm going to spark this idea in you guys. Uh, so cube maps. Normally, when you would sample a cube map in the previous generation, you would just trigger a cube map sample. It would be just one op, and that would be like magic happening in the hardware, right? Because sampling a cube map is not an easy thing. You need to select the side of the cube map. You need to select the coordinates on the side of the cube map. You need to make sure that your samples are ending up on the correct sides of the cube map faces, let's say like a corner sample. It's kind of complex. And the hardware was doing all this stuff for you. Now it's unified, so you only have a single image sample operation, the same that you use for text2D, for volumetric texture, for anything. But all the calculation happens manually. So eventually, this, everything that you're seeing here comes from just one cube map sample. The interesting bit, cube TC and cube SC are calculated to cards uh, for SC and TC coordinates in the cube map space. So if you guys know how cube maps works, this should be pretty easy. It's not super important right now. The important part is the cube map and cube ID. So those are the ops that are calculating the face of the cube map that's going to be selected by your UV. So a cube map in a UV is basically a ray being cast uh, inside of a cube, right? And the ray hits a side, and well, then, then that's exactly what happens in the cube ID. This problem in math is basically known as the problem of finding the major axis. So this is something that right now is implementing in hardware. And there are many, many different problems in, in math and in algorithms that are actually using, are based on the theorems of major axis finding. So now you've actually got the hardware op doing this whole thing for you. So if you would just take those ops out of this whole code, we're going to end up with this. So this is cube map face ID implemented in software that you can use whatever just for the software reference. And this whole code is just comparing all the, the x, y, z of your three-dimensional vector and choosing the, the cube map ID. So what can we do with this? Now we have a knowledge. We've got a new tool in our toolbox. And we can do some really, really fun stuff with it. So think about this, normal compression. You have quaternion compression, custom filter, uh, filter for filtering, let's say, shadow maps. Like previously, if you want to have a uniform size of a kernel for sampling your shadow map, you could not really do that without super high cost in corners or when the size of the cube map are actually connecting. Now you can calculate everything manually. Then if you want to do atlas cube maps, cube map ray marching optimizations, then you really want to solve the major axis uh, problem. And there are a couple of other problems that you can solve. What I'm going to focus right now on is going to be normal compression. So this is going to be a bit of math. We're like back in school right now. So think about normali normalized vector. So this is the definition of a normalized vector. Basically, x plus y plus z all squares, square root of them equals 1. Right? This is the definition of a normalized vector. Most of the normals that you store in your textures or in your gbuffer are going to be normalized. So a common way to reconstruct it, if you want to compress them, 
is to just use this, this, well, this equation and recalculate z out of it based on x and y, knowing that, well, the sum of them is going to end up as 1, right? So this is pretty cool. But it has one significant problem. The error distribution function of this compression is pretty bad, actually. Because the error distribution function, the ez, is basically the partial derivative of your compression algorithm multiplied by the error of x, y, where the error function is based on storage and reconstruction error. So the storage and reconstruction error is an error that's fixed in your compression scheme, right? The compression, the, the storage error, is the error of, let's say, a storing something in 8 bits, 16 bits, or 32 bits. And then the reconstruction error is the error of doing reciprocals, maybe, or you know, doing some op operations in hardware that are not super accurate. But what we, what the biggest problem of this algorithm is the DD thing. So the DD is the partial derivative after D, right? Where the D is basically the sum of x square and y square. So if you're going to calculate the partial derivative uh, of, of this compression, compression function, you're going to end up with 1 over 2 square root 1 minus d. What's the problem of this function? The problem of this function is that it goes to infinity when d is actually approaching 1. That means that your error is going to be infinite when you're compressing normals that are close to the major axis. So it might work in screen space because you can kind of like rotate your normals to make sure that you never hit that case where x and y together end up as something pretty long, right? So this means that when, let's say that I'm in screen space and this is going to be this vector, right? So you mostly don't care about vectors like that. You care about those vectors. However, if you'd like to store word space normals, this is not going to help you, right? Because close to every axis, uh, you are actually going to lose so much precision, it's going to be pretty much useless. So what can we do? Uh, a normal thing in math, when you have something that's, that's, just go back to this, this is basically an unbounded error distribution function, where unbounded comes from the fact that the, the, the limit of this function goes to infinity. So in math, when you want to, well, fix a compression scheme that has unbounded error, you want to bound the function to bound the error distribution. The easiest thing to do it in that case is basically take the smallest x and smallest, well, I mean the sm two smallest x, y, or z from x, y, z, and use them to compress, the, to basically bound the error. So imagine that you have a new function that's going to be d on x and y, it's going to be m square and n square, where m and n are basically the minimum of x, y, z, and the, med well, the median of x, y, z, with the constraint of the normalized vector. So what that means is that, that you're basically upper bounding your dx and y function on two-thirds. The two-thirds com comes from the fact that basically, well, those can go high enough to give you one when you get the, the lowest of them, right? So that's, that's rather the easy part. So what that means is that, that right now, your limit of your distribution, uh, error distribution function actually goes to minus uh, square root of 3 divided by 2. So we suddenly went down from the bounds of infinite bounds to an upper bound that's quite reasonable, right? There's like roughly one point something. So it's OK for our, like, from math standpoint. So now comes a, comes a problem, right? I mean, we did all this thing, all this math, and how do we actually code this? Uh, oh, actually, no. <laughs> I actually got back to this, sorry. So let's finish the math part first. Uh, so if you would have the error distribution function that's basically uh, doing a dot product between the normal that we, that the uncompressed normal, that's n, and n prime, when n prime is actually the decompressed normal with our compression scheme, we would like to plot this error distribution function. So what I did, I used a standard 7-bit s norm reconstruction, x, y, plus sign. So this is like a very, very standard way of packing normalized vectors that all the engines are probably using in some kind of form. So the error distribution function is actually pretty bad of this. If you're going to look at the mean, uh, mean squared error of this function, this is, actually, uh, this is actually in persons over the whole domain of x and y with this, the normalized constraint, you're going to see that this is something like you know, in 10,000s. So the average error of this function is actually pretty awesome. I mean, it's OK. But then, if you're going to try to look how the error actually distributes, you're going to see that the error is pretty minimal when the d is low. But when you get to something like 0.8 or 0.9, you're pretty much screwed. So you know from this error distribution function that all your normals are kind of flat or pointing in the direction of an axis on sides are actually going to be useless. 
So this is how it looks with like standard packing. And this is our new math function, the something that we just derived, well, five minutes ago. So the same distribution error function, right now, it's super, super low. And the best thing is that it's always upper bound by the same, let's say, line just here, right? What that means is that, that your error is very, very predictable. So if you have a choice in math to go for something that has a low average error, but a super high variance, and something that actually has a bit worse average error, but super low variance, you go for the super low variance because you can count on this, right? In that case, you want to go for that function. Uh, the additional perk and benefit of this is we went down from 3 point something in the average error down to 1.18. And the important bit is that, that we had a constraint that if the error distribution function is over 1, 10 bits, which like Unreal Engine is actually using 10 bits for the normal storage, only five, uh, actually 5.4% 5 of normals are useless which means that you know, they fluctuate more than we can actually afford. With the new math function that we derived, only 0.022% of our normals are bad. And we are storing everything in 8 bits still. So it's like 8 plus 8, right? And we have packed sign and stuff. So OK, so we blasted through a lot of math just to get some kind of distribution lower. And it sounds kind of horrible right now in terms of actually coding this, but it's not bad. It's not bad because of the new fancy stuff that we have from GCN. So this, this is what you would normally end up if you would implement the code that I, the, the whole math that we derived. So this looks pretty bad, and it actually is pretty bad. It's 28 LAU at full rate and two branches. If you want to cut out the branches, you're going to end up with something like 40-something LAU, and you're going to kill a couple of registers. So this is not cool. You probably don't want to have that in your gbuffer packing or unpacking, or you don't want to have that in runtime. However, if we look here, selecting the index and selecting the, the order of our normal packing, so the selection of you know, the, uh, the smallest x, y, z from, 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 the, from the domain, is actually a major access problem. So this is the same problem that you have in cube maps. So I know that you guys probably need some time later to read through this and think about that, uh, but from the code, it's actually quite clear that this whole code here, it can actually be substituted by a cube map uh, supporting function. And it's that's like that. So you can just use cube map's face ID to select the ordering of your normal vector for your compression scheme. And suddenly, we went down from like 28 LAU and two branches to 17 LAU. So this is actually comparable with any kind of compression scheme that you probably have in your gbuffer. It might even be faster, who knows? I mean, you need to check this yourself. And the best part is that the, the whole math that I just showed you can be used with any kind of packing. So if you have stereographic projection for packing your normals, if you have, I don't know, quasi equidistance projection mapping or those Crytek projection mapping that they're kind of famous right now, you can use that and you can slap this on top of it to minimize the upper bound of your error function. You can also do the same thing with quaternions. I've seen uh, a case where we actually had, it was Stephen McAuley from, uh, from Ubisoft. He's actually using quaternions in the gbuffer itself, and is massively helping packing this. So now we're going to another fun part of the GCN architecture. So I'm going to take a bit more of your time. We're actually kind of close to the end of the presentation, but this is kind of hardcore stuff. If someone would like to stay, I'll be delighted. If you guys are going to stay, I'm going to take at least 20 more minutes. So uh, someone feels like going for a beer, just go. Uh, so interpolators. So the cool thing on GCN is that interpolation, interpolation right now happens manually in a shader. So if you have your pixel quad that you want to shade and you have your triangle data, the triangle data is stored in local data storage. It's not like passed by some magical interpolators. Actually, the pixel shader is reading the triangle data itself. And that changes a lot what we can do with pixel shaders. So imagine that you have a typical setup. So we have a triangle that's like P0, P1, and P2 are the vertex data. What is a vertex data? It's a position of a vertex. It's a color of the vertex. It may be UV of the vertex. All the data you store in your triangle. Then you have VI and VJ. Those are the barycentric coordinates given by the hardware. And normally what happens in your pixel shader, what happened in the previous uh, generation was that you just pulled for this point, right? And the hardware was giving you P0 multiplied by VI 
to, I mean, the LERP from P0 to P1 plus the LERP from P0 to P2. So it was doing the barycentric interpolation for you and just giving you the result of it. Now, the shader is actually doing all this stuff manually in assembly code. So you're going to check your pixel shaders. You're going to see it happening all inside there. So the quick interpolate function is here. So it's like plain and simple. You take your bar-centric uh, vi, vj, you interpolate your data, and you end up with your result, right? So how does it actually work with all the flags when you have in the HLSL all the other stuff? So you can interpolate at center, at sample, or centroid. So it's going to basically change the vi, vj that you get from the hardware, because they are hardware states. But v0, v1, v2 are still going to be pulled from the LDS data, where the triangle data is packed. And you have a couple of flags, like no interpolation. No interpolation is actually automatically triggered when you have unsigned int or int and data in your vertex, which is pretty cool. It's not going to do all the, it's not going to do vi, vj. It's just going to read the data. So let's look at the sample. You have your interpolants, position, whatever, color. The shader is super simple. The code for it in assembly looks like that. Inter p1, inter p2 are the built-in functions that are actually reading the LDS data of the vertex and manually multiplying that by vi, vj, and giving you partial paracentric interpolation. So, so this happens like for all the attributes, right? This is the normal interpolation pass. And now the fun part. If you don't do interpolation, suddenly you get an interp mof, and you have this magical p0 here. I already mentioned that p0, well, it's the vertex data. So if you could actually have access to this function manually, you could read your p0, p1, or p2 manually and do cool stuff in the pixel shader. And this is what it's about. So you can pull the vi, vj from the hardware. OK, it's cool. It's going to be preloaded in a couple of registers, so you can pull it. You can use it for whatever you want. The one possibility of doing all this, this work is to do custom interpolation. So let's say you have byte, um, byte data for color, 8 bits for color. So we can pack RGBA into one unsigned in 32. Then your, the amount of data that you pass between stages is super, super low, right? Because you, you, just, you just optimize by compression. This can be a bottleneck. I mean, the interpolators can be an inter uh, a bottleneck in case of tessellation stages, geometry stages, all the stages that are just amplifying data. So if you see that your geometry is shader is slow or tessellation is slow, maybe you're hitting the bandwidth of your GPU just because you're passing so much data around. And you can optimize it with compression. You also don't want to interpolate things that are not interpolable. Like, let's say you have a constant color for the whole triangle. Right? You don't want to interpolate that. But let's do something super cool right now. So let's try reading the data of the vertex in the pixel shader. So you can actually use interpmov, uh, P0, P10, and P20. This is actually in both compilers for both next-gen consoles. And this is also in OpenGL right now for AMD since last week. So you can, you can just code it at home just like that. Uh, so this is a very simple code that actually is doing manual packing. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. You can just read it later at home. It's basically packing an RGB 8, 8 bit data into one unsigned in 32, decompressing it. So you have the get vertex parameter P0. It reads the data directly from the packed interpolator, so for the, for the vertex of your triangle. Then you unpack the color into a float 4. And then you do the interpolation with barycentrics manually, plain and simple. And now we're getting to really fun stuff. So there's a whole bunch of algorithms that you used to implement in geometry shaders. And because geometry shader had access to the triangle, now you have access to the triangle in the pixel shader. So you can cut out the middleman. You can get rid of the geometry shader if you only need the vertex data for the triangle. In that case, you can calculate parallax curvature estimation. In your pixel shader, you can calculate the closest distance to edge or closest distance to, to vertex, uh, or I don't know, like spline interpolation. So all those cool algorithms right now can be done super efficiently in pixel shader. Like if you want to have second order normals or like you know second order guard shading or whatever, just go for it. So one super cool use case was actually presented by Emil Parson a couple of years ago uh, when we didn't have this cool hardware. What he was doing, he was calculating the analytical distance uh, to edge of a triangle to do analytical anti-aliasing. It's it's really awesome visually. It's like you know, like perfect until icing technically because it's analytical. But it was very, very expensive because he had to go for a geometry shader to pull the data for the whole triangle. 
The idea is pretty simple, that for a single pixel of rasterize, you calculate the distance to your, to your triangle. In the pixel shader, you pick the lowest distance, write it out in a G-buffer, and then you have a blending pass that reads the G-buffer and uses those weights to blend in those two pixels to anti-alias your triangle. Because everything is analytical, it's extremely stable temporally. If, you're, if your triangle is going to move on screen, it's not going to flicker or anything. It's just going to be perfectly anti-aliased. With FXAA or some other algorithms that are image-based, you're always going to get the wave thing, right? the flicker. With this, you don't get that. And now you can actually use all the analytical methods in your pixel shader on consoles, because you have access to, to D1, D2 uh, in your pixel shader. So I actually implemented this in two projects after this point. Uh, I can't say that any of them shipped yet, <laughs> but the cool part is that is it was very, very fast. The resolve was something like half millisecond in full HD, and the write-out pass was just bound with bound. I mean, the cost of reading those vertices is like nothing, because they are already being read for your, let's say, UV interpolation, right? So you have all the data in your pixel shader, just a matter of using it. And now we get to the last part, the most hardcore part of the presentation, actually. So we have reciprocal square roots and re reverse square roots. So those are the expensive transcendental functions. Uh, all of them run at like quarter rate. I, I'm writing like 16 cycles, even if it's not super true with this architecture, but let's say that like 16 cycles are like slow, right? And they're very, very common in graphics because normalize is using reverse square root or it's actually doing divide and reciprocal or all the crazy stuff. We have it used a lot in ray marching, multi-sampling, SSAO, name it, right? I mean, you always want to divide by something. Also, macros like length and normalize, they also do reciprocals, which is kind of evil, actually, because the compiler is not smart enough to fix them sometimes. So. This, this is my favorite example. So I was optimizing SSAO that had those three lines of code. So we get a vector, we get the length of the vector with a length macro, because we need the length later for a distance estimation, and we also need to normalize the same vector, right? So you would expect that the compiler would be smart enough to at least compile it to one dot product for length and for normalize, but well, the compilers are dumb sometimes, at least. So in that case, you actually end up with dot product, Square root, dot product again, reverse square root, doing the normalize, and outputting the whole thing with moles. So this ends up as like 18 full rates uh, LAU, which sucks. The cool part that you can do, uh, well, you can rewrite it manually, right? I mean, get rid of the macros, rely on real code. So instead of doing length and normalize, we just do the dot product, square root, and reciprocal. It's cool, right? We went down from 18 full rate operations to 14 full rate operations because suddenly our, sorry. We went down from 18 full rate operations to 14 full rate operations because the dot product was calculated only once. But we still have the reciprocal here and we still have the square root, which is not cool. So we can move further, right? Uh, we know from math that we can actually get our square root from reverse square root multiplied by x. Or we can get the reciprocal from res reverse square root multiplied by reverse square root. Right? So we optimize it manually. We do all this stuff. It's not super safe for nans and divides by zero. We don't care. It just runs. And we end up with something around 11 full rate operations. So this is the fastest that you can go without cheating. But in graphics, we cheat a lot, right? So we've got a challenge. How do we get it faster? So can we actually beat the hardware? The hardware is doing the transcendental ops in four cycles. Can we beat those four cycles? This question was asked by a couple of guys in the 80s uh, doing SGI graphic stations. Then the same question was actually asked by John Carmack when Quake 3 code emerged. And uh, I'm going to show you first this. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar. This is the code from Quake 3 uh, doing the super fast square root re reciprocal square root. It's the, the infamous 5F whatever constant magic. I'm not going to explain why this exactly works. Um, this is something that you might read later on my blog or whatever. Basically, the thing is, you take your floating point number, you reinterpret cast your floating point number to integer representation, because, well, we can do floating uh, operations in integers, if you, know, you guys didn't know, but you can do that. And then you do some kind of magic, something happens, 
And then you reinterpret cast it back to float, and boom, suddenly you have a reciprocal square root. Then the original code from Quake 3 actually had one newton raphson iteration. newton raphson is basically a way of, of converging a function that has a saddle. Uh, it's like a math operation, just wiki it out, Google it out. It's, it's pretty easy to implement. So uh, does it make any sense nowadays? On CPUs, it actually doesn't make any sense because CPUs are faster than this. However, on GPU, like GCN, we can actually do that. So as I said, the general purpose registers on GCN are, well, they don't care if they're ints or floats. They're just registers. And the interpretation of the operation on the register depends on a type that you use. Like, you know, you write in something, there's going to be an int operation later on that register. And you have something called sint and sfloat that you might use for packing. So this is a nice define from my lib that I have running on PC and HLSL. This is something I'm going to share with you. Uh, it's basically a reinterpret cast of an int, I mean, of the float to an int representation and back. This costs you nothing. This is, this is just a hint for the compiler. So you can do this pretty much for free, right? I mean, no cost. So if you look at this code, you can imagine that you might be able to actually do a couple of those operations on the, on the GPU, and maybe you could do them fast. So let's get down to this. This is the code from the previous slide that I implemented super quickly you now for the GCN architecture. So you can see that you end up with one shift write, and you end up with one soup. And this is all. This is your reciprocal. It's done. So well, is, is it precise or, or is it not? I mean, why do we even you know, care for this? Uh, so we care for a speed. I removed the newton raphson iteration, so it's not going to be super precise. But there are many, many operations in math, in, in graphics, that we don't care about precision that much, especially if the input is like 8-bit or 16-bit or whatever. You can actually match your operations with the same precision that you would get from the storage error. So I can just tell you that actually making, uh, using a reciprocal from hardware with half floats doesn't make that much sense. I mean, you're basically like shooting you know, the cannon to a fly. So can this be better? On GCN, we already see that this is going to be twice as fast as calling reciprocal square root. So can we do even better job? And why and how does it actually work? So I spent some time deriving the math that we have for integer-based operation floating word or the other way around, and I ended up with this. So we have a function called QPOF or whatever that basically can be expressed like that. You have a k constant. You add n, some kind of n from domain of minus 1 to 1 that you have from the POF function, and you have reinterpret cast on your x minus the k constant. So this, this is a function that gives you floating point arithmetics using integer uh, arithmetics for a POF function for domain of minus 1 to 1. So you can eventually express all your like, you know, like square, cubic square roots or whatever with this. It's going to run faster than the hardware implementation. So how good is this thing? So there's a problem that uh, we obviously have an error here that comes from the, from the casting, you know, from changing representation and everything. And the s int on float is actually very close to logarithmic function. If you just look at the plot of a floating point number, you compare it to the binary representation integer, and you compare it back, you're going to see it's a log function. So that means that that can actually be optimized. And the error function that's based on the domain and the constant that you choose for your power actually is going to have a saddle, which means that the constant k that we've seen previously used by John and other guys in SGI stations was calculated for domain and for the exponent of your function which means that depending on your use case, you can calculate better case, right? So let's just do that. So what I did for one project was actually pre-calculating a uh, set of case for different use cases, for different functions, SSAOs, whatever, that were basically calculated per domain. So what you want to do, you want to find the best K for your N and X domain, or you can even find a reasonable k for everyone, right? So you can have a k that's just going to run with your puff function. It's going to be fine. It's going to have errors, sure, but it might be OK for you. So what I would personally recommend is to do a specialization to minimize your function error, which is basically find the best k for square root, reciprocal square root, and reciprocal. You can also limit your domain to positive numbers, negative numbers only, if you can or you can cap that to a far plane if you're doing with ray marching or ray tracing. So this is what we're going to do right now, very quickly. OK, so 
can we beat the constant that we had in Quake 3 and on SGI stations? Uh, so this is the constant that was basically found as a universal K for reverse re re reciprocal square root. What we are interested in right now, we're interested in domain of 0 to 1,000. Why 1,000? Because I was working with Ray Marcher that was working between 0 meters and 1 kilometer away. Right? So let's say my view space. In that case, uh, the, the relative mean square error for k in percentage for, for this specification, so basically exponent is minus half, well, so this is reciprocal square root, it basically looks like that. So here you have the constants. Here you have the relative error in persons. So you can see that quake free uh, constant is somewhere here, right? But we already said that the error function is, must, ha must have a global minima, right? It must, it must be a subtle function. So we can do a second uh, derivative binary search or any kind of other derivative search on your domain. And we can very quickly find the perfect constant in 32-bit integers. If you're working with 64-bit integers, we can also find the perfect in 64 for that, right? Because, well, it's always going to be one specific number for your domain and your n. So we found something better. And how good is this thing? So this is the error function for my new uh, fancy, fancy constant. You can see that it's not super great, close to like 1 to 100. But the range that I was actually interested in myself was, was here, like in the middle. So it was pretty all right. I didn't see too many problems with that. It was OK. If you're looking for something in a different range, just recalculate it yourself. Uh, the source code for finding this is going to be a bit later this or next week, somewhere on the internet. Um, so this is what we have, like a very, very basic version of our fast shader math lib. So you have the reciprocal square root i triple i approximation for reciprocal, reciprocal square root, and a square root. The functions are super, super easy. And it's also pretty cool because the, the reciprocal itself is only one, one full rate operation. It's kind of silly that you know, it just a sub, right? And for square roots and reciprocal square roots, you also need to do one uh, bit shift. So I'm going to give you a couple of cases. Uh, there are like different, different cases that we have here uh, for different domains, and they have different relative mean errors. So you can see that actually for those domains, the relative mean errors, at least for square root and reciprocal square root, are actually not bad. I would, I would call them quite sane, quite good, depending on your use case, obviously, right? I mean, if, you, if you're I know, writing um, a rocket launcher guiding system, like John is doing sometimes, that's probably not cool. But if you're making a game, this should just work out fine for you. If you're doing super sampling, SSAO, or I don't know, marching, it's going to be cool. You're not going to kill people. And reciprocal is actually quite bad. Um, I don't really use it that much myself, but sometimes, you know, just go for it. Uh, so the last sample is going to show you how I was optimizing the SSO and bilateral filtering, because in bilateral filtering, you also have the division for the, for the weight calculation. You have the dot products, the normalize. You have the same thing in SSAO. So in SSAO, you want to calculate distance. That's going to be square root, right? You want to calculate normalize, reverse square root. Bilateral, divide, normalize, and all this stuff. So switching our already really, really optimized SSAO and bilateral filtering to shader fast map that I just showed you gave us 13% total performance improvement. And that's global, right? We actually saved 20% in LAU code alone. I would say this is quite huge for something as silly as that. And then visuals, right? I mean, what's the difference? So this is, this is one version. That's the base version. And hey, this is the optimized version. So the difference is here. It's basically this bit here, and it's not very much. Because you can see that this latch here is quite close to the background. I mean, I, I, I'm telling you it's close. Uh, so you remember from the function distribution error that the error near 1 and 10 is actually pretty high. So this is why, why you see this error here. But apart from that, it's pretty much OK. So yeah, this concludes this presentation. Um, what I tried to show you is that, that right now we have a whole bunch of really cool new ops, new ways of dealing with this hardware. 
and we can really push it farther by using all the tricks that you guys probably knew from SPUs, from CPUs, and you know, like standard processors. Because right now your GPU is actually a standard processor. So just use it and do it. This is just the tip of the iceberg on GCN because we have so much more to learn, which includes like async compute, scheduling, latency hiding, caching, tons of other things. But the cool part about things that I've shown you today is that every single thing I've shown you can be implemented over, under 30 minutes. So, you know, like if you'd like to do like latency hiding operations or whatever, it's going to take you weeks with, you know, analysis tools. This stuff, you just plug it in and it works. And you can find more stuff there. Uh, you can poke me. And we are also hiring. So thank you. Questions? Uh, one more thing. I've got some references at the end to other presentations or people that actually spend a lot of time with GCN. Uh, just poke those people, check their presentations. There's some good, good stuff there.